good morning, everybody. Happy Mother's Day uh, this morning. Just a couple of quick announcements. Um, next Sunday, potluck, sign up sheets out back. Um, sign up for that. We're looking forward to that. Also, next week, Pastor Paul will be on the pulpit, um, our interim pastor. And uh, we do have communion also scheduled for next Sunday morning. So prepare your thoughts for that a little bit. Um, and I was asked to uh, just let you know that, uh, start thinking about VBS. Warm weather's coming. We'll be into VBS mode here pretty quick in June. Uh, a lot of volunteer uh, help that we need for that, of course, to pull that off every year. So start getting your, getting your mind and your heart set on putting that VBS together. Uh, Matt is with us again this morning, Matt Tuniga. He's been with us the last couple weeks. Um, oh, something else? Oh, yeah. One of our rowdiest events ever. <laughs> Those ladies, I'm telling you. Yeah, on Wednesday, yeah, the ladies' uh, uh, luncheon uh, this Wednesday. If you haven't signed up for that, be sure to get lined up for that. Um, I've never been invited to that, but I, they, they say it's a great time. But anyway, Matt, uh, we appreciate having you with us again this morning. Um, thanks for uh, the last couple of weeks um, of bringing the word to us. We, uh, Enjoy again having you with us this morning. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome everyone to morning worship. If you're a member here or if you're visiting, and uh, it's been really a, a pleasure to be with you these last few weeks. Um, I've had Chris and his brother Dave as former students, so sometimes Chris would tell me, about the church here, but I'd never actually visited here before, so it's been a pleasure to see that and the people that he was working with. Um, please stand to hear the call to worship from Psalm 112, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. The greeting is from 2 John verse 3. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, who will be with us in truth and love. Please greet one another in his name.
1 John 1, verses 8 through 10, says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. So as we come together this morning, uh, we do not claim to be without sin, but indeed we confess it openly uh, before God and before each other, uh, that not only have we not done anything to earn God's favor, but we have done many things to forfeit it. And yet we know that we can confess this because he is such a good God who will forgive us. So let's do that now, not just as a rote exercise, but as a heartfelt offering to God, confessing our sins with sorrow for them, and yet with a joyful confidence knowing that he will forgive them. Let's pray the prayer uh, of unison together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace, and may we run to your throne of grace often. Forgive us for everything that hinders us in running the race. We thank you for the wonderful gift of salvation that you have given to us through Jesus Christ. Because of your wonderful grace, we desire to live for you. Give us the power and wisdom to guard our mind, emotions, and heart. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's sing together, Oh, How I Love Jesus. John continues writing to uh, the Christians to whom he's writing with great compassion. He says, 1 John 2, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's not just that God is a a generous or patient God who when we sin, he's like, oh well, don't worry, I think nothing of it. He does think much of it. And yet he loves us much more than that. He actually paid the penalty for our sins himself. And so uh, we not only have uh, confidence that he'll be merciful, but Uh, We have his promise that we have, in a sense, a right to his forgiveness because the penalty for our sins have already been paid. And so we can continue to worship him with that confidence that God is for us. There is no one who could be against us. Let's continue to worship then by bringing our prayers before him.
Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, great is your faithfulness. Morning after morning, we see your mercies. Everything that we need, you continue to provide for us. We thank you that you've given us so many reasons to praise you, and that you've taken us and made us part of your body, the body of Christ, the city of Zion, who is a defended, which is defended by powerful walls, such that your enemies see and know that they cannot touch us because you protect us. Lord, we thank you that you are such a good God, a God who is worthy of praise for so many reasons. Lord, this morning we are mindful of the day we call Mother's Day, and it's a time for us to do at least once a year what we should be doing every day, and that is honoring uh, those women who have given birth to us and cared for us, Or maybe even uh, cared for us when they didn't give birth to us. Maybe uh, they adopted us or they took us under their loving protection or counseled us or advised us. We thank you for those who are mothers and have been mothers to us in so many different ways. And we pray that they would feel the joy um, that you've created mothers to feel. That they would feel the Uh, the thanksgiving and the honor that they deserve. We pray that you would encourage them. It's not an easy task. It's a lifelong burden. And we know because of the curse of, of sin from the very beginning, it has been accompanied by many sorrows. We know that our mothers aren't perfect. They are sinners like the rest of us, and yet they so often pour themselves out in loving self-sacrifice. And so we pray for our mothers here among us today that you would also give them strength and wisdom, whether they're caring for young children or whether they're caring for uh, adults in in different ways. Uh, We pray that you would give us wisdom. And we pray that for mothers especially who are weighed down, perhaps because of children, whether young or old, who have broken relationships with them or have strayed from you, And we pray for reconciliation, both between children and parents, and between uh, those children and you. Lord, we pray for those today who perhaps are mourning the loss of mothers, or the absence of mothers. And a day like this can be difficult. Or perhaps uh, those among us who have mothers who do not know you and who long for their salvation too. We pray that you would work in those mothers who do not know you and and make their children means of, of grace in their lives. And we pray that you would comfort those who who mourn the loss of mothers, whether because those mothers have passed away or because they weren't there. And pray that that as the body of Christ, we would see that In fact, our earthly biological ties or even our legal adopted ties are not as significant even as the ties you have built among us as the body of Christ. We think of Paul telling Timothy to to treat the older women as mothers. We think of Jesus telling uh, the crowd that those who did the will of his Father in heaven were his mother and his sisters and his brothers. And so we pray that we would, even on a day like this, remember that our, our truest family, our permanent family, is the body of Christ. And that we would seek to be mothers to those who lack them, or even those who have them. And that we would honor the women among us as mothers. And Lord, we, we ultimately learn how to care for one another, whether it's as mothers or fathers or brothers or sisters. And because of how you have cared for us. And we even think of that Bible passage uh, which says that you, like a mother, 
and gather your chicks under your wings because you love us and you care for us with deep compassion and you have sacrificed yourself for us. And so we pray again that we would do that for one another, not just one day out of the year, but each and every day. And that the world would know by the way that we love and care for one another that we are your disciples. And so, Lord, this morning we bring the various concerns we have known to us as a body, known to us as individuals, and we pray that you would answer the concerns of our hearts that we bring silently before you this morning. And Lord, we do pray for the communities in which we live, our neighbors around us. We see so much brokenness. We see so much sin, uh, even a desperation. And we pray that you would make us salt and light. We pray for your mercy on the communities around us, uh, that they too would know your salvation. We pray for our, our sister churches of various denominations, that you would bless them that you would make their ministry fruitful. And we pray for those that you've placed in authority over us, whether here locally or uh, whether in our nation. And we pray, uh, too, that you would bless them and that you would especially give them wisdom and a commitment to do what is right and what is just. And, Lord, we pray, uh, ultimately, That the gospel would go out, whether here or abroad, through the work of missionaries or regular pastors or even just regular Christians who share the gospel with their neighbors. We pray that the gospel would go forward, that your kingdom would come, and that all things would be made right. And Lord, now as we prepare to bring our offerings, we pray that you would use those uh, for uh, the good of your kingdom. And uh, And we pray that you would prepare our hearts to hear and receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, We'll now receive the offering for the general fund and then Christian education as well as for the Esther School.
Our scripture reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans. Romans, and I'll be reading some verses from chapter 2 and then from chapter 3. I'll start reading at Romans 2, verse 1, reading through verse 11, and then skip forward to chapter 3, verse 10, reading through verse 26. As uh, you turn there, I'll just note it, it's uh, on page 1091, I believe, in the Pew Bibles. Um, you'll see uh, throughout Paul's letter, he'll often use the word righteousness or justice or justify and different variations on those words. Um, what I just want you to be aware of is they actually all come from the same Greek word. So the word righteousness could be translated as justice. And when you see that, you see that talking about justification and righteousness is all talking about the same set of concepts, this great concern Paul has in Romans with the idea of justice and God's justice in particular. So uh, let's keep that in mind as we hear the word of the Lord from Romans 2, starting at verse 1. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. And then skipping forward to chapter 3, verse 10. Chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. The right, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. 
He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Let's pray for a moment before we hear God's word again. Lord, we pray that in the sermon in the next few minutes that uh, the gospel would be proclaimed very clearly and that each one of us from the smallest to the greatest would be able to understand it more clearly than before and would have the confidence of its completion on their behalf and that they would have faith in Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen. Well, the message of the passage that we have just read is important. If you believe this message that all have sinned and are under God's wrath, and that God justifies those who put their faith in Jesus, and if you put your faith in Jesus, you will be saved. And then whatever happens to you in this life, from this day forward, for good or for ill, your end will ultimately be good. But if you do not believe it, if you refuse the salvation given to you in Jesus, then whatever happens to you today and from this day forward, whether for good or ill, your end will not be good because you remain under the just wrath of God. Martin Luther wrote about this book in his introduction to Romans. He said, this letter is truly the most important piece in the New Testament. It is purest gospel. It is well worth a Christian's while not only to memorize it word for word, but also to occupy himself with it daily as though it were the daily bread of the soul. It is impossible to read or to meditate on this letter too much or too well. Now you might say, well, why did Luther say this letter of all letters was so important? Well, the reason was because as Luther had learned, many in the church in his day did not understand the message of Romans. And as a result, many of them believed that it was their works that saved them or perhaps their participation in the sacraments of the church, or their purchase of a document called an indulgence, or maybe some pilgrimage or great act that they had done. And they desperately needed to hear the good news of God's favor to them in Jesus because they were weighed down by all the things that they had to do, all the things they had not done, and whether or not it was enough. And perhaps you actually live this way, even though maybe you've been in the church for years and yet you still psychologically act and think as if you have to earn your salvation or as if God will not truly be favorable toward you until you get things together in some way, shape, or form. But that is not the good news. The good news, as Romans 3 verses 21 through 26 teaches it, is that Jesus has satisfied the justice of God. And because he has done that, everyone who receives him in faith will be saved. And so if you put your faith in Jesus, you are indeed justified in God's sight. He views you as perfectly righteous. I don't walk through this passage in its greater context uh, in three parts. First of all, we're going to look at the problem What's the problem with our relationship with God? Secondly, how is it exactly, according to these verses, that we are saved, or that problem is solved? And thirdly, how should we respond to this message? So first of all, the problem. It's fairly simple. God is a just God, a righteous God, and we are not just or righteous people. In fact, he is so righteous that he cannot look at unrighteousness without fighting against it or punishing it. Paul writes in our text, For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And as we saw in the uh, verse immediately preceding it, he says, By the works of the law, no human being 
will be justified in his sight. Now, to get a full understanding of what Paul is doing here, you need to look back to Romans 1. And in particular, if you looked at verses 16 and 17 there, Paul presents what is really the thesis statement or the argument, if you will, of the whole book of Romans. What is his goal in this letter? He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in the gospel that is, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. That's verses 16 and 17. And then after that, from Romans 1 verse 18 on, he is going on all the way to 3 verse 21 to make sure we understand why this gospel is so important. He's outlining the problem. And you might say, well, we're the people in church on Mother's Day morning. You don't need to tell us the problem. But Paul's writing to Christians too. It is indeed important to make sure that we do understand the problem. You see, one of the reasons many people get the gospel message wrong, misunderstand the gospel, is because they get the problem wrong. That was true in Luther's day. It's also true in our own. And if you think about it, if you take your car to a mechanic because your engine doesn't work, it doesn't help if the mechanic fixes your air conditioner, changes your oil, and even gives you a brand new set of tires. If he doesn't actually fix the problem, it's not going to be good news for your car. And there are some people who think that our basic problem is simply that we're not righteous, And we need to get righteous by the time God issues his final verdict. Now, of course, it is true that part of the problem is that we're not righteous, but that's not the whole problem. There are others who think, well, the problem is basically one of the heart or the attitude. You know, we we don't love God like we should. And so we simply need a change of heart. We need to be made to truly love God by the time again that he issues his verdict and then he'll be good to us because he knows that our heart is in the right place. And again, that is part of our problem, but it doesn't capture the whole problem. The real problem, the heart of it, according to Romans 1 verse 18, is that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And in the next part of Romans 1, he goes on to explain what's going on here. He basically says, you know, God created the world good and he revealed his own attributes through it so that all people would be without excuse. They ought to naturally worship him and of course love one another, but that's not what they did. Instead, they intentionally suppressed the knowledge built into creation written on their hearts. They intentionally suppressed it, rejected the creator, and instead worshiped the creation itself, often by making idols. Verse 21 says, although they knew God, this isn't talking about Christians, This is talking about everybody. He says, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. And so the text goes on to say throughout Romans 1 that God gave them up to a host of sins. They turn on their creator, so he sets them free in a sense. And and the text talks about things like sexual immorality, homosexuality, but it also lists many other things. It says they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, 
they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Now, it's possible you could look at Romans 1 and single out a few of the sins that Paul mentions there and say, I'm not guilty of that or that. But if you read the whole list of sins and you're honest, you know we all stand condemned. Indeed, I can say if you hear that whole list of Romans 1 and you have never committed any of those sins, you have no need of being here this morning. You don't need a gospel. But I know that you know that we are. We've all fallen short. There is none who does good. And the verdict has already been revealed. Exodus 34 verse 7 says that God is a God who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generations. Habakkuk 1 verse 13 says that God is of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. And so Romans 2 verse 2 says, We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who do such things. In verse 6 he says, He will render to each one according to his works. And in verse 9 he says, There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. It's that simple. It's not just that you need to get righteous by a certain point or to love God by a certain time. It's that you're already sinners with a long track record of sins and God must punish evil. He's a just God. He will bless those who do good and reward them and he will punish those who do evil. In fact, that's sort of the definition of justice. Even the pagans know it. The famous ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle defined justice as giving each person their due, what they deserve. And who can argue with that? If you were coming up with a perfect world, would you not want it to be ruled by someone who would encourage and reward good and discourage and fight against and punish evil? Is that not how those of you who've had children have raised them? I mean, would you prefer a world with a God who encouraged evil and punished those who do good? Obviously, that would be a dystopia. It would be a perfect nightmare. Isaiah 59 is one of the passages that Paul is quoting in what I read to you from Romans 3, he quotes a number of Old Testament passages to show human sin. Isaiah 59 is a chapter worth going on if you have time later today and reading the whole chapter. It portrays God as looking down on the people of Israel and being shocked at the rampant immorality and injustice. And he says, where are the people that I've made in my image, to exercise dominion, the people who are supposed to intervene and put a stop to this. Why aren't they doing anything? And he becomes angry because it's not right. It's not just someone ought to do something about this. And Isaiah then describes God arming himself for war. Isaiah 59, starting at verse 15, says, The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so will he repay wrath to his adversaries. And this is a good thing. It is good that God is a God who is zealous for justice. He will defend the innocent against the guilty. So it raises the question then, why is this a problem? It seems like God is a perfect God. Exactly what you would want the sovereign Lord of the universe to be. And of course, the problem is not with God. The problem is not with justice. The problem is with us. 
As Paul himself has said, no one is righteous, no one is just, not even one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And insofar as we see this scenario that I've traced out for you as a problem, it's because we are actually opposed to justice itself. We are enemies of the good by our sinful nature. And we have to recognize that and acknowledge that. You know, we watch movies and we always identify with the good guys. And if it's some big, you know, epic conflict, we're always happy when the good guys defeat the bad guys. And yet in the real story, we are the bad guys. And if it's a simple case of justice, we are the ones who ought to be defeated. We ought to step back and think about the case. Would it have been possible for God in his righteousness to simply judge and condemn the whole world, destroy it and start over from scratch? Paul, in a sense, asks this question in the first part of Romans 3, which I did not read to you. Romans 3, verse 3, uh, Paul asks, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? And then he says, by no means, let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. And then verse 5, he asks the question perhaps even more clearly. He says, but if our, righteous, if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, What then shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? Would we dare say that? That God is unjust to inflict wrath on us? And Paul's answer to that is by no means. For then how could God judge the world? How can God be a just judge and yet not inflict his wrath on us who are unjust? And I hope you see now that that is indeed a great problem for us. This is the problem that gave Martin Luther great sorrow because he thought he had to achieve the righteousness of God. And he he confessed that he came to hate that very phrase. He came to hate the very idea of God's justice because he only saw how it could condemn him. And by nature, that is indeed the way it ought to be. And yet, at that point, our text comes in with one of the most important transitions of all of Scripture. We take it for granted, perhaps. And yet, if you're following the, law, the logic of Paul's argument, it ought to take you completely by surprise. He says, but now... The justice, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. In other words, there is in fact a way for God to be just and find us to be just while not dishonoring the very idea of justice itself apart from the law. And Paul notes as an aside that the law and the prophets, which means the Old Testament, has borne witness to this all along. It has pointed toward this, although the people didn't always see it very clearly. And then verse 22 identifies this righteousness of God, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. It's a clear concept here. And you might think to yourself, well then, why is it so confusing to so many people? The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus for all who believe. And here I remind you of the misunderstanding some people have of the problem. Remember, there's some people who think that our basic problem is we're not righteous enough, and they think that uh, faith is a gift God gives us that enables us to begin to perform that righteousness. And hopefully, by faith, we can become righteous enough for God finally to accept us. And then there are those other people who think that, well, the basic problem is with our heart or our lack of love for God. And when God gives us faith, it leads to a change in heart. We actually love God. And if if we're sincere about that, then God will indeed accept us. But neither of those deals with the problem of the wrath that God already owes to us because of our sin. And the good news is that if you look closely at our text, 
It's not dealing with those two misunderstandings at all. It's dealing with something much more important. Look at verse 34. There it says that those who are justified, sorry, verse 24, those who are justified are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Or as the ESV puts it, they are justified by his grace as a gift. And two things ought to jump out at you from this. First of all, it is a gift. You can't earn it. You can't do anything for it. Not even through the faith that God gives you. That wouldn't be a complete gift. That would be a project. But it's a gift. God gives you the righteousness by faith in Christ Jesus. And secondly, it is through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, it's not actually faith that justifies you. It's the redemption that is in Christ Jesus that justifies you. As many theologians have put it, faith is indeed the instrument that enables us to lay hold of Christ's redemption. But Christ's work is what does the actual saving. Think about it. You know, you all need food and water to survive. You also need instruments, whether it's your hand or your mouth or utensils, to get that food and water in your body. But it's not your hands or the utensils or your mouth that saves you. It's simply what enables you to lay hold of what you need, the food and water itself. That is what saves you. In the same way, faith is not what saves you. It's what enables you to lay hold of Christ. He does all the work of saving you. And verse 25 then explains exactly how this works. Uh, The NIV says, uh, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. The ESV puts it with a different word. It says, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Atoning sacrifice and propitiation are both attempts to translate a Greek word that's very important to understand because it gets at the heart of what's going on on the cross. What the word means is the turning aside or even the appeasing of God's wrath. The satisfaction of God's wrath. That's, if you followed everything I've said about the problem we have, that's really important to understand. What the text is saying is that in his suffering and death on the cross, when he shed his blood, Jesus was bearing the full-fledged wrath of God for all our sins on himself. And not only was he bearing it, he satisfied it. He quenched it. All the injustice and the pain that others have caused you. All the injustice and the pain that you have caused others. All your sin is judged there in the body of Jesus by the God who has sworn to condemn the guilty and defend the innocent. It's as if in that passage we talked about earlier, Isaiah 59, it's as if God has armed himself for war in all his zeal for justice, in all his anger against justice. And he has come down and you think you're about to receive the blow and then you realize he's got his son there with him. And all that passion and all that just wrath, that zeal for the right, is poured out in a punishment on his son. It's not child abuse because his son is voluntarily willing to do this for you. And as a result, the justice of God is completely vindicated and satisfied. That is your salvation. It's not your love for God. It's not your good motives or your good intentions or your good works or your worship or your repentance. None of that can save you. Your salvation is the full wrath of God falling on God himself, the son, Jesus, who suffered excruciating torture and utter abandonment to make it 
possible and true for you. And so while we can sit here week after week and nicely listen to sermons and worship God freely and rightly believing that God has only good in store for us, the only reason that can happen is because God himself was nailed to a cross and had to cry out with all his strength and utter confusion and horror, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What was the answer to Jesus' question? Why did God forsake him? Well, look at the second part of verse 25. Why did God forsake Jesus? He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. In other words, all through Old Testament times, all the way up to the life of Jesus, God in his mercy had left sins unpunished. He'd given people promises He proclaimed mercy to all those who would repent and follow him. And yet he was a just God who somehow had to vindicate justice. And it was a great mercy to the people how God could be both just and merciful. And so here in the cross, we get the answer to that question. The cost of mercy. Look at verse 26 there, Paul says it again. He says, he did it to demonstrate his righteousness or his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those sinners who have faith in Jesus. As Paul puts it in Romans 4 verse 5, it is this that shows how and why God could justify the ungodly. And you might think to yourself, was this really the only way? I mean, God is all-powerful, right? We, we say this as children. God can do anything that he wants. Surely God could have come up with another way to save us. And I think Jesus asked himself the same question in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was sweating drops of blood, when he's crying out to God with all his loud cries and tears. He prays, Father, if possible, in other words, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. And yet he said, your will be done, because he knew there was no other way. The reason there was no other way is because God is a good God. He is a just God, and that means he must fight against evil. He can't see evil in all its evil and not fight against it. The only way was for him to deal with that evil head on by, as the creed says, descending into hell on our behalf. Ye who think of sin but lightly, nor suppose the evil great, as the hymn says. Here may view its nature rightly. Here its guilt may estimate. This is what it took for the righteousness of God to be manifest apart from the law. This is what it cost God to be able to say to a world of sinners that if you simply place your faith in my son, you will be saved. This is the cost of God's love for you and for me. And it was when Luther saw this for the first time in Romans, clearly, that he says he felt truly born again. Suddenly, he he stopped perceiving God's justice as a threat. He started seeing it as a gift, and he let all his works go, and all his efforts go. And with it, he let go all his anger at God and at God's law. This is the radically transformative impact of the gospel when you truly understand it. So I want to spend the last few minutes here by briefly talking about what does this mean for us? And this is also very important. How can we receive this gift of redemption that is in Christ Jesus? Because we know that scripture does still hold out warnings for those who are not in Christ. Well, thankfully, the answer is quite simple. Simply receive it. Simply receive it by faith. Simply trust in God's promise that he has given this gift to you in Jesus. Paul writes, and here I'm quoting the ESV version of it. I think the logic of it's a little clearer. Paul writes, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God 
and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Think of what is being offered here. As as it says elsewhere, all who call on the name of the Lord, all will be saved. It does not matter what sins you have committed, how wicked they were, how persistent they were, how often you have committed them, how, how many times you've returned to them again and again and again. It doesn't matter. They're all satisfied on the cross. It doesn't matter how horribly offensive they are to other people or to God. Jesus said of those who crucified him while they were in the act of crucifying him, the most heinous thing you could imagine, while they're doing it, he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And I dare say none of you have committed any sins greater than that. The death of the Son of God is of infinite value. It's more than enough to cover your worst sins. So if you've not yet believed in Jesus, I implore you this morning to do so. Put your faith in Christ. He desires that all people be saved. He desires that you cast yourself on him, that you might have life in his name. Now, there are some people who have put their faith in Christ, but they still struggle to come to grips with the fact that it truly is a gift that it truly is all they have to do. So let me make it as clear as I can. If, if you believed in Jesus, there's nothing you do or try to do apart from that that will affect your standing with God. Nothing you do or try to do can make you righteous. You are accepted by God based on what Christ has done and that alone. And finally, if you do have your faith in Christ, if you understand Just how great of a gift this is. Then praise the Lord. As Paul says in Romans 8, If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. In other words, if you have any fear left, if you think I'm still coming, my trial is still at hand, then what Paul's saying, remember, the judge himself is the one who died for you. He himself is the one who already took your penalty. He himself is your lawyer. There is nothing that can go wrong here. The trial is over. You're completely free to love God, to love your neighbor, to grow in grace, to live as humans were made to live, knowing that whatever happens to you from this day forth, you are destined to live in the kingdom of God with all your brothers and sisters forever. When you're on your deathbed, if you get the opportunity to reflect on your life, it will not encourage you if you sit here and think, well, has the good outweighed the bad? Have I done enough? Was I faithful in the most important ways? Was I a good husband or wife or father or mother or child? Forget it all. Just focus on Jesus, what he did for you. I conclude with the words of Paul, the glorious Romans doxology, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are so 
good. Your justice is beautiful. And yet what makes it all the more amazing is that while that would have been bad news for us because we are so unjust, we are so sinful, yet you are so wise as to have found a way to be both perfectly just and astonishingly loving and merciful. And we see in the gospel, Lord, just how great the cost of that is or was in the work of Jesus on the cross. Lord, we pray that each person here in this room would have the gift of faith to lay hold of Christ and receive the gift of righteousness in him. And Lord, we pray for our loved ones who, or, or neighbors, friends, we, who we know do not have this hope. And we pray that in some way, perhaps using us, perhaps using others, you would reconcile them too to yourself that they might know this truly good news. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our song of response will be, And Can It Be? Please stand as we sing.
God's blessings from 2 Corinthians 13. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.